Good morning. Good morning. Today's reading is from Ezekiel 34, verse 1 through 6. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, this is what the servant Lord says, woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not the shepherds take care of the flock? You eat cur the curds, clothe yourselves, the wool and slaughter the choice animals but do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, or bound, bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or search for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because they was no, there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wander over the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. Because you will keep your Bibles at opening Ezekiel 34 that Foster read for us this morning. If you're visiting with honored guests, I'm very thankful that you're here. If it seems like I'm a little punchy, which is not unusual, but I mean, if it seems like, because I had three days, I was up at Ganderbrook at the men's retreat, but it was a little more tiring than normal because I got to do the thing I always dreamed of doing. I worked in the kitchen. <laughs> You know, you start at six in the morning and you end at say thirty at night, and 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 you would say to yourself, Artie, I didn't know you had any culinary skills, and I would say, You're right, <laughs> but I twisted Gary Babcock's arm. And I said, he says, well, what will you do? And I said, my job title is this. I lift things up, I put them down. <laughs> and so I wash dishes, I wash pots and pans from 6 in the morning to 8.30 at night. No, they did let me stir a big vat of mashed potatoes, which took both arms to move around. And it did, I was able to brown a big thing of, uh, of uh, sausage. And I did make some lemon drop cookies which I kind of burned the first time. And so they said they were going to use for spare tires, but that's all right. They gave me a second chance to do it. But I, I, I've always wanted to do it. I didn't think anybody would let me do it. And that's why I just invited myself to do it. <laughs> and, and since it was our territory that was basically hosting this, they let me do it. And so it was a precious time. Let's go to God and pray. Lord, so very thankful for how much you love us. We thank you, dear Lord, for this time to be together. And we ask, dear Lord, to bless this time. Maybe a time, dear Lord, that we can encourage one another. A time, dear Lord, that we can build each other up. A time, dear Lord, that we can lift our praise to you, for you are due our honor and glory. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be called your children. And we pray earnestly, dear Lord, you help us realize truly what that means. And we stand in awe of your tremendous love for us. And we pray, dear Lord, earnestly that we understand that on a deeper level, that truly, dear Lord, it is a motivation in our lives. Lord, we're so very thankful. Thankful for all you do. Thank you, dear Lord, for your spirit that indwells us and strengthens us. Thank you, dear Lord, for your precious mercy and grace that we so desperately need. We thank you for all that you give us. Please, guys, be with us as we share your word. Help us, dear Lord, again, to have a deeper understanding of your will, your nature. Thank you for your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have been on a journey, of course, dealing with the story of the kingdom. But we're pausing in a second because we realize in the story of the kingdom, spiritual leadership is vital, especially in our homes, but especially also in the body of Christ, the community. And because of that, it's been mentioned already, we're moving forward towards looking for elders. And next week, I'll be preaching on the qualifications of elders. 
But we're reminded of the text, of course, that Peter said in 1 Peter 5, beginning at verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal to as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering, and one who also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds, or pastors, translated either way, of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, or again, or bishops, not because you must, because you're willing, and God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Those three terms that are used for the elder, the eldership, because always in plurality, really are help us understand basically the role and function that these men play. It says elders, of course, that means, of course, one that are old <laughs> or older. They're mature. They have developed spiritually. And they're able by their spiritual growth to be able to lead and counsel from their experience in the Christian walk. But then you have the term overseer. We talked about this last week. And the overseer, of course, they're charged with the responsibility of overseeing, overseeing God's people in a number of different areas. One of the things you find when you look at Ephesians chapter 4, and that is the idea that they're charged with helping the body grow really in two very vital areas, their understanding of the truth and their works of service. And those are the two areas that they facilitate, that they bring about from that point. And so it's obvious, as we mentioned last week, that as we start thinking about men who will serve in this role, then we'll be looking for men that have demonstrated their service in the body of Christ. Because they're going to help others grow in this area. That they've made a, a priority in their life, worship and service and study and fellowship. That that's been a goal, something that they been involved in their lives. That active parts of the body. Peter noted in that text that we read that the overseer is an example for those whose care they are taking care of. They're overseeing. They set the tone by the lives that they live. And one of the things I mentioned last week is one question we need to consider is if the whole congregation followed their example, what would it look like? Because they're setting a pattern. We also noted that the overseer is a steward of God's household. Making sure, of course, that God's people follow God's will. Because the steward's charge was fulfilling the will of the master and making sure they function that way. And so they've got to be men who understand God's word and is capable of applying that word to how God's people should function. Because as Paul mentioned when he was speaking to the elders of Ephesus there in Miletus, that the church is always under attack. And one of the things that the elders are to do is that they're to be proficient in understanding God's truth, Titus 1 verse 9, and also being able to defend God's truth. Because there will be those wolves. There will always be wolves ready to come in, those false teachers. And the elders are supposed to stand guard. Guard against these who could come in and destroy the body. There are men, as we talked about last week, that are willing to sacrifice and serve. Because remember, God said, and Jesus enumerated this, and that is basically leadership in the kingdom is turned upside down. Because it's not about power, and it's not about authority, but it's all about service. Because in reality, one who would serve leadership in the kingdom means one sets his sight on being a slave. Remember what Jesus used the term, slave to all. Because basically, as we ended last week, the story of the kingdom is not about who's top dog. 
who is willing to be a slave, stoop down and wash feet. Yet there is another term, of course, that Peter mentions that are used for these men. For Peter said, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. The word shepherd, as I said, could also be translated pastor. That's a powerful image. And it creates a picture that really helps us really understand the agenda that God has intended for the eldership. The interesting thing about that term is it's applied to God. It was David, through inspiration, that penned that beautiful psalm, Psalm 23, as he describes God's care for his people. And this is not a bad model for us to think about when we think about men serving in the eldership. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, the term shepherd, as I said, is a rich term that gets across what? Protection, sacrifice, and a deep love for the flock. One who cares and feeds the flock. I mean, it's not only image that is applied to God, it's the image applied to Jesus. It was Peter who said that Jesus was what? The chief shepherd. And so one who serves as a pastor slash shepherd is an elite company. So let's ask a question. Some of it should be obvious, but why the model of a shepherd to describe the role and function of the elders? You know, if God wanted and his deep concern was that the body be in order, that things were done orderly, that things would function well, that he would have chosen the model of a general, not a shepherd. You ever see a flock of sheep? Do they look orderly? There's nothing orderly about a flock of sheep. Basically what a shepherd does is kind of keep them going in the same direction. Now, order is important, but could it be that God, that's not the most important thing that God wants these men to focus on? who lead the flock. See, God could have chosen a businessman. If he was concerned about the bottom line, if he was concerned about the results, concerned that things get done. That's a good model, businessman, manager. But he didn't choose that model. He chose a shepherd. I mean, when you look at a flock of sheep, do you think of terms like goals and production and results? No. Mm -hmm. Now let me suggest to you, goals and results are important. But could it be that God's not what's most important to God and what these men focus upon? He said no. I want you to think of these men, and these men need to think of themselves as shepherds. Thus our text. Turn it back over to Ezekiel 34. <clears throat> Ezekiel 34, God takes the task, the leaders of Israel, the shepherds of the nation of Israel. This is a time, of course, when God had just punished his people sent them into Babylonian captivity. And one of the reasons why this took place is because the leaders in Israel, the shepherds of Israel, forgot that they were shepherds. 
forgot to do what they were supposed to do. And so the text says, the Lord, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherd of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourself with the wool, slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. What was going on? These shepherds were carrying a focus on themselves. That's what was most important. They looked to serving themselves as opposed to serving and becoming a slave for all, of serving the people. Because this is so important. The single most important objective of a shepherd is the care of the sheep. And that means the single most important of a spiritual leader is the need, spiritual needs of God's people. That's what God wants us to have in mind. The care of his people. The Hebrew writer notes, Hebrews 13, verse 17, Obey those who rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. They have to give an account. As those that must give an account. But look as we continue on in that text. <coughs> in verses 4 through 6. God talking about these spiritual leaders, these shepherds of Israel says, you have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You've not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You've not, you have ruled harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the hill, over all the mountains and every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. So, what does God expect of the shepherds of His people? Well, the opposite things of what these shepherds did, and that really starts giving us an outline of the function of why God has the imagery here of a shepherd. One thing that he says, you have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You hadn't cared for them. You didn't take care of those who are weak and struggling spiritually. That's what God expects of his shepherds. That they're in tune with his people, that they know who's struggling. They're aware when things are not quite right. So they can be proactive to strengthen the weak and care for those who are in spiritual distress. That they have a relationship, that they develop a relationship. You can't lead a flock, you don't know who they are. And so they, we're doing that, but that's what God expects of his shepherds, those who shepherd his people. He also said to them, you have not brought back the strays or search for the lost. Because the shepherd, when one strays, is to go after the one who has strayed. He's charged. He's charged to care about them, to try to restore them, to bring such a one back. For when one loses their way back into the world, it's God's shepherds who are charged. I mean, remember what Jesus said. So suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds them? Jesus says, that's the standard for God's shepherds. 
That they are concerned about those who drift away. That they're concerned about those who fall back into the world. He goes on to say, so they scattered because there was no shepherd. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, there were shepherds, but they weren't doing their job. They weren't watching over the flock. They weren't caring for the flock. They're more concerned about themselves and their power and their interests. But they, they were not leading them. Because in reality, see, when it comes to sheep and the shepherd, he doesn't drive the flock. He leads the flock. Go back to that model that David painted here of what a shepherd should be. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. For God's shepherd is to guide and counsel those under his care. So they can mature spiritually. The Hebrew writer noted in Hebrews 13 verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Their example sets the tone. These elders, these overseers, these pastors are men who counsel and guide and call others to follow. Because again, verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Because our text goes on to say there, and when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. One of the reasons, and it kind of goes back to Acts chapter 20, one of the reasons why it's so important that they be the shepherds they're called to be is because the flock is always under threat. There are dangers just out there beyond the care of the shepherd. There are those wolves in sheep clothing, those false teachers who are ready to decimate the flock, destroy it, rip it apart. And when they are scattered, when there's no one leading, when there's no one standing at the gate, those wolves get in. So what is the role of God's shepherds? God's shepherds are to help God's people through the wilderness. Life. To bring them safely home to the promised land, heaven. To deliver them to green pastures. To help them through the valley of darkness. To be a guide as they go along. Again, go back to the idea that Jesus is the chief shepherd. I mean, Jesus said that he is the good shepherd. This text in John 10 is interesting. One of the things that jumps out to me in John 10 about this relationship that Jesus has with his flock, with us, is the idea that he intimately knows us. He knows who we are. He knows our voice and we know his. The text says he knows him and calls him by name. In the Middle East, and while I've shown videos of it before in the Middle East, each shepherd had his own call. And he would give that call out. It's amazing. You could see a whole sea of sheep 
But when that shepherd gives the call, isn't it interesting? You watch it. I've seen it. Out. You Just his sheep come out. They recognize him. And they begin to follow. They won't follow another shepherd. They only know that call. That's the intimate relationship. That's why God uses the picture of a shepherd. Not a businessman, not a general, not a manager, but a shepherd. Because of this intimate love and care there is between the shepherd and the flock. Because those who lead as God's pastors, as his shepherds, lead out of love. Their deep love for God and their deep love for God's people. <clears throat> John 10, beginning of verse 2. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Because that is the nature and relation of one who would shepherd God's people in the kingdom. <clears throat> That's why he gave us this image. To understand the role and function that takes place. What's most important to God? Is it order? Well, order is important, but it's not most important, I suggest. What's most important to God is results. All results are important, but I suggest to you that's not most important. I suggest to you what's most important is the care of his people. I suggest to you what's most important is that more of his sheep make it to the green pastures of home. <clears throat> that we help through the wilderness of life and make it to the end. The stand sing us off. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and roundly rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world.
on the uh, following songs. Number 136. Uh, 136. Seven song, sorry. That's right. <laughs> you know, even when you sense you're talking about the eldership, these principles that are involved in leadership really play in all the roles that you might play as a leader and for God's people. Jesus made a statement again, go back to John 10. He says, I'm a good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. Just the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. There's three important principles there. For every husband, there's three important principles. For every elder, there's three important principles. For every Bible school teacher, three important principles. The first one is, you know whom you are leading and teaching. You know them. You have a relation with them. You're able to connect with them because we connect in different ways, don't we? You know who they are. I know my sheep. I know who they are. And then he says, because I have a relationship with the Father. We can't lead people if we don't know the Father. We are leading them not to us, but to them, to him. And the third is, I'm willing to lay down my life for them. I'm willing to sacrifice. Fathers, do you know your family, your children, your wife? Do you have an intimate relationship with the Father that you're able to lead them to Him? And are you willing to die for them? That's what we're called to do. See, that's what God designed it for, because in reality, that is how we are in reality slaves to all as we serve. It's one of the things we signed up with, or signed up for, when we became his children. We made that decision, of course, when we believed Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and we're willing to confess that before others for the rest of our lives. That will change the direction of our life. A life that very often is self-centered. But life, change the direction where it's no longer about us but Him. Submit our soul to the water grave of baptism where we die. <clears throat> our sins are forgiven. We receive the Spirit. And we begin a journey. A journey following Him. The Good Shepherd. If you have need of invitation, I invite you to come now as we stand and sing. One three six. One three six. Fake of us.